And I'm thrilled to present our next um, speaker, Professor Andrea Maya from NUS Singapore, who is, oh, yes. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it's so nice that it's coming from the audience because <clears throat> I don't want to. So if, if we could very, very, very kindly ask the, um, the guests in the, in the lunch area to may, maybe, um, you know, reduce the, 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 the volume a, a tiny little bit because um, the echo in the hall is so strong and it's actually getting here and um, it's not, um, it's, uh, the acoustic is not greatly um, helpful. Without further ado, Andrea, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being with us. And along your presentation, we will see all your amazing affiliations. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. And Rafa, attention. Yes, it's the echo. Yeah. <laughs> Well, no, no chat, but then outside, no. Seriously, um, nice to see you. Um, great to see all of you. Um, I am going to present another first longevity clinic, which is going to open in a publicly funded hospital. There are the three of us, which are all opening in 2023. And I think it's a very good, very nice battle a little bit. Who is uh, opening first? Where is Sifi? Sifi, I think we are all the first, yes? But most importantly, <laughs> there's applause, which is great. Um, because who, who would have imagined like two, two years ago that we would actually open uh, longevity medicine clinics in a publicly funded hospital. So that three are there is, is I think, great. Um, today I will talk about especially diagnostics and how to implement that also in clinical practice. I will showcase a um, case I saw in the private clinic I have, Qi Longevity, in the afternoon or later in the afternoon. And tomorrow I will talk about um, interventions. But I really love this photograph because it really shows the beauty of our body. And the beauty of our body um, is very often neglected if you are aging. So I think to maintain that beauty, we need lots of diagnostics to then tailor our interventions to make somebody healthier and, and showcase that beauty of, of our body. To do that, in Singapore, we created an ecosystem. And as also uh, in Shiba Health, uh, we have different components. A very important component in the ecosystem in Singapore is the preclinical research led by Professor Ryan Kennedy. We, since two and a half years now, have a clinical um, approach to, so bringing the preclinical work to the clinic, to the clinical research. We have observational studies. Um, we also collaborating internationally. We have randomized controlled trials using supplements and using uh, repurposed drugs, but also lifestyle interventions. And what we do um, very soon, and I will showcase you that in, a, in, a, in the next slides, we also now open um, the longevity medicine clinic in a publicly funded hospital at Alexandra uh, Hospital. And as I said, there is already a, pub, in, um, a privately funded uh, clinic. But also uh, imagine if everybody is aging here, um, then 100% of us needs care. So we need to bring it from tertiary care centers into public health. And that's also what we are doing. In Singapore, there are districts. And one of the districts, it's a health district. It's a health district in Twinstown. And with uh, more than 50 PIs, uh, all do preventative research. We now also have projects in the health district to bring preventative care to um, the, the general population, which is quite exciting. And also the clinic is implemented in that, um, in that uh, health district in, in Queenstown. Very importantly is that we have three major aims. And that the first one is finding the right diagnostics, which can be implemented in clinical care. So really to lower the biological age. The second thing is to have that intervention core, to really have the streamlined, um, very well organized randomized controlled trials in, in humans. And the third one we added just four months ago, we, uh, we uh, established the NUS Academy for Health and Longevity, which is our education uh, part, which is important. All these together with public-private partnerships have to make sure that we are targeting and we are increasing the health span by three years. That's our target at CHL, the Center of Health and Longevity, in the next um, decade. And that should be feasible, I hope. Most importantly, I think you all have a smartphone. Um, just 
bring your smartphone and check this QR code. But I now also, next to having that smartphone, I would like to know who is the member of the Health Longevity Medicine Society already. Hands up. Okay, very good. There are still too few. <laughs> because an ecosystem only works if we have structures. I'm German, I'm very structured. Um, but we need something like a society bringing us together to make sure that in the end, health and longevity medicine is a recognized speciality within the hospital and within the healthcare system. So that's the reason why last year we founded the Health and Longevity Medicine Society actually during this conference. And um, in November we met and we did define what health and longevity medicine is. And that's optimizing health and the health span by targeting aging processes across the lifespan. And I think that's very important. We have more than uh, 100 healthcare professionals now being a member. We also have associates and we have the one in training. And you will hear much, much um, more later uh, during the afternoon about HLMS. So on the one hand side, bringing it into clinical practice, we need diagnostics. And on the other hand side, we need interventions. Um, from a diagnostic part, it's very important that we have a biological phenotyping, a clinical phenotyping, and then we have a digital phenotyping. So think about your smartphones, etc. What can we as physicians learn from it? On the other hand side, we have supplements, repurposed drugs, lifestyle interventions, etc. we can give. So that's the reason, what, because we have both, which are both absolutely not regulated yet, but we have to regulate it to really say yes to the FDA. This is a good outcome parameter. This is a good intervention. Please put the stamp on it that also health insurers can actually pay for it. But these are the, the most important um, things we, we need. As I told you, I will focus on um, the, the diagnostic part. And very importantly is we have to define and speak the same language. What is the biomarker of aging? What is a clock? I won't say what is aging because even there, there is a debate. But what the biomarker of aging consortium did um, very nicely in a very nice process and lots of uh, the authors of a paper which will be published in Cell on the 31st of August um, are here in the room. Thank you so, so much. Is the definition of what is a biomarker of aging. And that is a quantitative parameter of an organism that either alone or in the composite predicts biological age and ideally it's changed in response to interventions. I think that's what we need. We have to speak the same language. We have three different important biomarkers and that first one is a predictive biomarker. Think about the yellow fingers smokers have. It's a very nice predictive biomarker for lung cancer. Is that an aging biomarker? Not really but we need predictive biomarkers. Most importantly is we need responsive biomarkers. I want a biomarker changing my risk of a certain incidence of a disease. If I just color my, my yellow fingers and making them white again, it's not responsive. So we don't want in principle the, the predictive biomarkers, but especially the responsive biomarkers. Think about CRP as a very nice responsive biomarker or HP1EC. We really need surrogate endpoints. Um, and what is that? That's a combination of a responsive biomarker together with a biomarker, it should be the same, being associated with either the incidence of disease or, or mortality. So the surrogate endpoints are very important. And these are being used also in clinical practice to, for example, um, uh, power uh, observational uh, studies or even uh, randomized controlled uh, trials. Um, we published recently a, um, a very nice paper uh, using the UK Biobank, using more than 140,000 individuals. We were all healthy to see if we can build clocks based on markers every GP in clinical practice could already use. Because in the end, yes, we have genetics, we have a microbiome, we have uh, all the omics approaches, but at this moment in time, GPs already have so much um, variables, can we actually use them? So on the left-hand side, you see what has been measured in the UK Biobank in which we used. So everything which could be implemented already now. On the right-hand side, you see how we developed clocks. And we developed body, a body clock, an overall clock, 
and we developed organ-specific clocks. And of course, first we used uh, the first generation clocks, so it should predict mortality. But on the other hand side, then we also thought, okay, can we predict the incidence of the first disease? Because in the beginning, we started with healthy individuals not having a disease. So what you can see here is the body clock. So the overarching clock using all the parameters. And the body clock was able to distinguish the ones after six, six years who were developing the first chronic disease, for example, COPD or diabetes, uh, et cetera. So the body clock was already at baseline, quite predictive to see what's happening in the future. And that's what we need, I would say, who to invest in. If we as GPs, I'm not a GP, I'm an internal medicine specialist, but it also um, tends to me, who I should invest maybe more resources uh, on. We also looked at, okay, you on the one hand side, we have a body clock. On the other hand side, we develop lots of organ-specific clocks. Think about a cardiac clock, a pulmonary clock, a muscle clock, a metabolic clock, with all these parameters. And what you see here are the results, how good they are to predict the first incidence of the first disease. So think about osteoporosis, cancer, diabetes, um, etc. Everything what is green is already significant. If it's more red, it's even more significant. Everything what is gray is not significant. What you can see is that the body clock was most predictive for the incidence of a disease, much, much more compared to organ-specific clocks. However, the organ-specific clocks, and that's logical, is most specific um, in terms of the prediction of a disease which is happening in that organ. So it all makes, makes sense. But for now, uh, what we really try to achieve is to validate that in GP practices in, in, um, in uh, Singapore. And that's a valid study, where we really validate it in, in an Asian uh, cohort. But what we also did is we were interested in the sequence of the aging process in these healthy individuals. What we wanted to know is which organ deteriorates first and can we see a sequence what's happened next? So for example, if the pulmonary function of individuals goes down, is it also likely that the cardiac function of these individuals goes down or is it the reverse? So does the cardiac system first deteriorate and then the pulmonary function? So we did lots of network analysis and what you can see here is a really nice network out of follow-up data of the first six years and then the other six years of the UK Biobank and what you can see that there is a sequence. If a pulmonologist measures the pulmonary function or GP of a patient and that goes down quite massively, it's very likely that that individual also has a deterioration in the cardiac function. So which means a pulmonologist should then give the data or send that individual to, for example, a cardiologist, but not vice versa. So these kind of network analysis really helps us to dedicate the money and the time of our healthcare system, uh, hopefully into the right direction. But we have to validate that in, in much, much more um, ethnicities and um, in other cohorts. What we also have to achieve is, it's not only a, a person coming to you and you're measuring the biological age in a clock, but what we found is there are so many determinants which are very, very useful to understand that client or the patient much, much better. For example, how much green space does somebody has? Green space is not only associated with how much, if you have a dog, for example, and there was your uh, walking um, uh, much, much more, but also it can influence, for example, the sleeping quality or um, how, what the eating habits are. So I think very importantly, but I don't have time to go into detail, is really understanding the environment where somebody lives. And we tried that, uh, at least linking that to the biological age clocks uh, for a little bit, but much more research has to, to uh, be in that space. Very importantly, don't look at the wrapper locks at the moment, but this is a systematic review just showcasing you that if we are doing randomized controlled trials and we are trying to understand where the evidence is, that very often in randomized controlled trials in humans, we do not measure all the physiological system of a person. So it's not about Rapalox, I will talk about that tomorrow, but it's more that we are missing the evidence of the entire aging trajectory 
um, of a person, of, of the function of the organs in lots of randomized controlled trials. You already heard this morning of this beautiful speech, there's Repalox, yes, there are not many trials, but even we have no idea if it's changing the respiratory system or the digestive system, or think about women's health. So we really have to invest in showcasing how we measure the aging process using all our organ systems. Um, that's the message out of that slide. What we also have to do, um, and I don't have the solution yet, maybe a little bit solution because the solution might be given by the new company, New, is that as clinicians it's very hard to make use of all the data available. And New is a company who is at the moment making use of biological data. Think about all the blood data, think about the genomic data, think about the microbiome, bringing these together to really enable us as clinicians to see what kind of decision we should make. Um, the CEO, um, N.A. Kusker, is somewhere in the room. Just, yes, there he is. So what we try, and I'm the medical chief medical officer, is to really understand the data much, much more and making sense out of the data to then come up with recommendations and the solutions. And it's looking a little bit like this. This was a year ago. I'm much, much biologically younger at this moment in time, of course. <laughs> but. Um, it's, it's really hard, and I think this is at the edge of clinical practice to bring these kind of data to make it useful and meaningful for clients. Because in the past, we only looked at groups, and now we are jumping into clinical practice. So I won't talk about Qi longevity, but especially about the new op uh, to be opened uh, clinic and the publicly funded hospital. But I would like to start in just thinking, you won't know him, but it's Henry Kwak. He is the MP uh, in Singapore, and he held the most fabulous speech a couple of months ago, asking and advocating to have more fundamental research of the biology of aging and implementation of what we do into clinical practice. And he asked the question, during the debate, when is the Healthy Longevity Medicine Clinic opening at the Alexandra Hospital? That's so beautiful that politicians argue for us, and I think that should be the case, being um, uh, in prime line, CNA being uh, depicted. So, when are we opening? Um, we are opening Thursday, at the 31st of August. Um, that's the reason why I have to leave tomorrow. We are going to open with a delegation of Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum. Um, we first uh, wanted to open at the 1st of September, but Singapore said, hey, at the 1st of September we have elections. <laughs> so the elections uh, were actually uh, set to be at the 1st of September. That's the reason uh, 10 days ago that we had to set it on the August the 31st. What is our objective? It's to target and to delay the biological aging process by bringing diagnostics and interventions into place. We are starting with 400 individuals in the first instance. Then we are evaluating it. We are enlarging it to 3,000 a year. After the 3,000, we are opening the next uh, longevity clinic. We also include cost-effectiveness analysis, but most importantly is implementation uh, science. So how do you actually start a longevity clinic? What is needed? How do you train the staff? What kind of rooms do you need? How many zincs do you need? Where do you get the providers uh, from? And of course, we also need lots of uh, research uh, with regards to consumer and healthcare professional satisfaction, because otherwise nobody maybe wants to work for us and with us. So, and of course, we have to upskill the health professionals. So we have diagnostics and we have outcomes. We have a multidisciplinary team and we have lots of personalized uh, intervention and a beautiful team who is, uh, who is heading it. How does um, a journey look like? We, of course, have first the screening. We do the baseline assessment. Um, we are linking them to variable devices. Uh, we then have a multidisciplinary meeting to make sense out of the data. And then we are starting an intervention for 12 months where we have a, um, a new assessment after six months and then the final assessment after 12 months. Our target is at the moment to reduce the HB1AC and CRP because it's a surrogate outcome parameter and surrogate endpoint. So that's where we powered it on of 400 individuals. Um, at this uh, moment in, uh, in time. Very important, I'm closing there, is the Academy for Healthy Longevity. Um, four months ago we started, we have talent incubators, we have mid-career classes, and we have master degrees, um, and we are starting um, 
tailor-made uh, programs. And this is the first batch, I would say, of the Healthy Longevity Incubator uh, talented um, individuals. We had a huge uh, success. Uh, we had uh, lectures and courses from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. I can tell you after 10 days, everybody was super exhausted and needed sleep for, for a week. It was quite cheap, 290 Singapore dollar, all inclusive, because we really wanted to bring it to everybody. It was rated a five-star program. Um, hopefully, everybody here in the room who have youngsters, please um, let them submit their, their application. We will do it again in July uh, next, uh, next year. And especially, we also did research with them, and we included more than 1,500 individuals, Singaporeans in research, just uh, in six hours uh, during that uh, day. Not to forget, if you still have your iPhones, um, there's another QR code. We have a conference in February dedicated on supplements, um, quite educational, and we also have an intensive uh, course. Thank you. I mean, I will do it. Just, uh, yeah. Thanks. Simply stay for a moment. Thank you so much, Andrea. Great, as always. Um, we can take one question from the audience. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, Jose. Very prominent. Uh, excellent presentation, uh, Andrea. My question is about the clinics, because I'm interested in clinics also uh, in Europe and in Spain, where I live. Um, you uh, talked about Shiva in Israel and uh, Mayo Clinic, but Mayo is not a longevity clinic. In the USA, there are two chains, as you know, Human Longevity on the West and Fountain Life on the East Coast. Why don't you partner with them? We, we want to partner with every, everybody. In the afternoon, I will showcase what our working groups are. And one of the working groups is, if you're, if you're working in a publicly funded hospital, you want to open and you already have opened a longevity medicine clinic, please be in contact and we will see if we can include uh, a you. May I just, it's, it's a quite, it's a remark what you made. This is not a longevity clinic. Um, I think nobody knows yet it's not being defined what is a longevity clinic. And I think this is what we need to do. Even I cannot say I'm a longevity medicine physician. We don't have longevity medicine physicians here in the room because it's not defined. So I think the first task it's not the first task. The first task was what is longevity medicine? The second task is what kind of education do you need? What do we do? What should be outcomes? And this is very important. So for now, everybody is welcome. We don't judge if you're really longevity medicine clinic, yes or no, but you have to be publicly funded for that working group. Wonderful, thank you so much once again.